Our scripture reading this morning is Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, and it's taken from Eugene Peterson's The Message translation. When the Pharisees heard how he had bested the Sadducees, they gathered their forces for an assault. One of the religion scholars spoke for them, posing a question that they hoped would show him up. Teacher, which command in God's law is the most important? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important. The first on any list. But there is a second to set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. These two commands are pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophets hangs from them. For the still speaking voice of God, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day, the gift of this life, the gift of love. As we sit in this space and wonder about that love, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, Elena, our new administrative coordinator, and I have kind of started a running joke um, about the theme of love and how everybody in churches seems to always want to hear about it. Sometimes I think that we talk about love so much that we have the danger of becoming that clanging gong or symbol that Paul warns about in his letter to the Corinthians. And so I hope that our meditations today don't lead us to such a place. Our scripture this morning from the message translation reminds us that loving God is first. About a month ago, our words for meditation included part of the prayer, may you love God enough that you love nothing else too much. Then and now, I think that's kind of scary, kind of frightening, really hard to consider. Think about all the things in this life that you love and how much attention that you pay to them. And imagine all of that being supplanted by love for God. I'll be honest with you and say that I I don't think that I've always done that. Sure, I do love God. I put on this robe and this stole each week and I serve my call. But there are things in this life that I do pay more attention to than God. Now, maybe I'm alone in that, and that would be interesting for this dynamic. But I, I don't think that I am. And I think that that really matters. I think that reality matters. What does it mean to believe in the still speaking voice of God, but not love that voice and love it deeply? Not dedicate time and energy to waiting to hear or receive that voice. Not reflecting on that voice. What is love if not listening and knowing that you have been heard? When we pray, How often are our prayers things that we want to be delivered from or some problem we would like to be solved? How many of those prayers then too are about gratitude or notes of thanksgiving? I imagine most of us offer up a bit more of the former than the latter. I think that's somewhat natural too because in the world in which we live, the things that we accomplish, the successes that we achieve, that was all us. But all the bad things happening around us, all the things that we don't like, that has to be because of somebody else, because of something else. And so my success is mine alone, but if there's a problem, well, God has to show up for that. I've always found it a bit ridiculous when a football player scores a touchdown and points up to the sky, most often in praise of God. But I think there's a lesson there, too. That's public love. That's a public prayer and sign of gratitude for goodness, 
for success. As weird as it might look to watch in real time, there's something profound happening in that moment. Doing that kind of prayer, doing that kind, showing that kind of love is hard. Love is hard. You can go through your entire life not loving God, not even believing in God. We know this. There are plenty of successful people who have done and are doing exactly that. And that highlights the reality that love is a choice. Loving God is a choice. And it's not an easy one. Loving God is demanding. It's a kind of love that asks us to entrust so much of ourselves and our lives into someone, something else. It asks us to remove ourselves from the center of our own lives. Not because we aren't important, but because loving God just happens to require even more love than that which we might give to ourselves. Loving God asks us to look at the world in a new light, as a place where something new and spectacular can always come into being because of the choice of love. I won't go much further into this this morning because I'm still working through my own theology around these concepts, but I think it's important to note the distinction between love being demanding, but not a demand. Such a reality is, I think, emblematic of God's unending love for us and an example of the ways in which we might love God and love others. Love others as well as you love yourself. This sits alongside the first commandment. And in more common translations, Jesus says that this commandment is like the first. They cannot be divided. You cannot do one but not the other because they have to be together, as difficult as that reality might be to accept. As I was preparing the sermon, I was reminded of a song that we sang at each of our family worship services at the church in Brookline. I served as seminarian before my call here. The song is called Ubuntu, meaning I am me because of you. And some of the lyrics are as follows. I am me because of you, and you are you because of me. I will see the best in you, and I know that you will see the best in me. I will guard your dignity. I will lift your spirit high and wipe your tears from your eyes. Lift your voice and sing your part. Let us hear what's in your heart. Love is the answer. And as Bishop Curry reminds us, love is the way. But here too, much like loving God, we have to choose to love people. Loving each other isn't necessary in the world. Indeed, the absence of love hasn't stopped nations from being built, hasn't stopped huge monuments from being constructed, hasn't stopped all the great things that have been achieved in this world. The absence of love has not stopped any of that. And indeed, the presence of love doesn't automatically mean that everything will be okay, nor that we will be happy, or safe, or free, or live lives of fairness or equity. And yet still, I think that choosing love is worth it. I can't think of a better time to choose love. And this is mostly because, for the first time in human history, we are living in a world that is actively being constructed in such a way so as to make love of ourselves and each other a very hard thing to do. We are targeted by algorithms that push ads, as many as 10,000 separate ads to us every single day across TV, social media, the bus stop, anything you're looking at, 10,000 ads that tell us that we should cover up our eczema or psoriasis with this brand new lotion because the skin that we're in isn't good enough, that we shouldn't love the way we naturally happen to be. We're pushed to buy retinol and niacinamide and some pumpkin enzyme mask because we shouldn't have fine lines or wrinkles because aging is bad. We stigmatize weight and different body sizes and all that's just about loving ourselves. 
apps like Citizen and Nextdoor, and yes, even doorbell cameras, all have a danger of pushing us into a place where distrust, suspicion, and a curiosity devoid of love are the default from which, you, from which we encounter and experience the world. As you've perhaps gathered in my sermons, I believe popular culture has a lot to offer us in the way of faith formation. And I look forward to a day when we do more of that here at Central, because I think it's one of the great untapped potentials for understanding who and how we are in the world. When it comes to love, I'm reminded of Florence and the Machine, an English indie rock band, and their album High as Hope. The first song on that album is called June, and it includes the line, love became an act of defiance, which is followed by a chorus that just repeats the line, hold on to each other. And later in the same album on the song Patricia, we receive an outro that says, asks rather, are you afraid? Because I'm terrified. But you remind me that it's such a wonderful thing to love. It's such a wonderful thing to love. And that's the root of it all. Last week, we talked about a story for all ages and the end of age. Love is the center of that story. It's what prompts God to call the world into being. It's what lies on the other side of this life. And it can be a part of this life, too, if we choose it. We're reminded in John that those who cannot love a sibling whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but loving God and loving neighbor are in near lockstep with each other, with loving God leading the way. Together, they both point us to a new reality, to a healed relationship, to a wholeness with each other and with God. And so among my prayers for us this day, one of them is that we might finally put our love on top. In the words of our common read author, Valerie Kaur, that we might choose a love that is more than feeling, that we might commit ourselves to that sweet labor, fierce, bloody, imperfect, and life-giving, a choice to make over and over and over again, because it's a wonderful, righteous, radical thing to love. And I hope, too, that you might choose love, not because you must, but because you may. Amen.